Hello and welcome to today's panel cast event, Preventing and Recovering from Ransomware. Today's event is produced by Actual Tech Media, and we have some fantastic sponsors, uh, experts on ransomware prevention and recovery on today's event from Rubric, Unitrends, Know Before, and Druva. So thank you sponsors for supporting this event, and thank you everyone out there in the audience for joining us on today's completely live and hopefully very fun and educational event. So before we get into it, just a little bit of how, housekeeping here that we need to cover. Um, first off, uh, my name is David Davis from Actual Tech Media, and I'm excited to be the moderator on today's event. Uh, as I said, we want this to be educational on the registration form for the event. We had a, a question box there and it said, what would you like to learn? And I have to say, I think we received more questions from this ransomware topic than any other panel cast that we've done. Uh, there were easily over 100 questions in there. I sifted through them myself, and uh, I've tried to take the best questions and kind of combine questions that were similar uh, to use as the questions that we'll be covering today. But we also want your questions here on the live event. So as the speakers are presenting uh, and answering questions, feel free to pop more questions there into the questions box, and we'll take the questions you know, as they come in. I also wanna call your attention to the handouts that are there uh, in the GoToWebinar control panel. You can click on the handouts. We have handouts from each of the different presenters and there's some very valuable resources in there related to ransomware. So make sure that you check that out. And then at the end of the event, we'll be giving out three $100 Tango gift cards these Tango gift cards can be exchanged for gift cards at you know, all the major retailers and online companies, Apple, Amazon, Best Buy, places like that. So uh, that's why we use those Tango gift cards and they never expire. Now I'm excited to introduce today's presenters. Uh, we have Mr. Matt Elliott, Technical Marketing Engineer at Rubric. Uh, Matt, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, hey everyone, um, again, Matt Elliott. Uh, uh, my background is really in networking. I've been in IT for about 20 years. I've uh, been at Rubric for now about six months, working in technical marketing. Um, I work a lot with um, automation and open source and have a lot of background in security as well. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for being on. Uh, Eric, tell us about yourself. Yeah, so my name is Eric Crone. I'm with No Before. I'm actually the security awareness advocate, which is kind of a cool title. Uh, basically, I get to go around, uh, do things like this, talk at uh, different uh, uh, conferences, and, and share some of my experience. Uh, I've been in IT since uh, about the mid 1990s. So, excellent. Yeah, thanks for being on, Eric. And um, Adam, Adam is a technical lead generation specialist at Unitrends. Adam, tell us about yourself. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. And thank you so much for having us on uh, today. Yes, I'm the uh, the technical specialist for our demand gen organization. Uh, so I like to think of myself as being trained like an SE and thinking like a marketer. I've uh, been with Unitrends a little over three years here. Um, and before that was with uh, national solutions provider CDW. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for being on. And finally, Mr. Curtis Preston, Chief Technologist at Druva. Curtis, tell us about your background. Hi, thanks, David. I have been in uh, the backup space for 26 years and uh, written a couple of O'Reilly books on backup, and now I am here at uh, Druva. Excellent. Thanks for being on, Curtis. So we have some really great uh, experts here to answer all the questions on ransomware. Now, before we jump into it, uh, I just wanted to do a little bit of, you know, kind of stage setting here. Uh, when it comes to ransomware. And I've been looking for an opportunity to use this Lego graphic because I, I thought it was really cool when I saw it. And I've been saving it for just this opportunity. Uh, here you have Darth Vader and the stormtroopers uh, stealing your data with ransomware. And what I find funny is actually the stormtrooper there holding the popsicle, apparently uh, enjoying a popsicle while he steals your data and and holds it for ransom. But I mean, in all seriousness, um, I was a former, I'm an IT manager myself uh, in the past. Uh, I was responsible for my company's data. I talked to lots of you know IT practic practitioners out there in the field today. Uh, you see it in the news almost every night. Uh, everyone's concerned with their company's data. And it's a scary time for us uh, who are responsible for protecting our company's data. I mean, we have massively growing data sets. Uh, the data is growing just seemingly uncontrollably. 
at, at most companies. And at the same time, that data is being distributed uh, across mobile devices, laptops, desktops. You know, you have your on-premises data, then you have uh, public cloud, maybe multiple public clouds, and then different now SaaS offerings in the cloud. And our company's data is, you know, in many cases, just very hard to even put a finger on uh, exactly where it is. And then we have the responsibility to protect all that data. And at the same time, attackers are trying to attack that data uh, at all of those different points. And so it's our job to protect that data. And then there's some scary statistics out there. I mean, in the news, we hear that, you know, cyber crime damage costs are set to hit um, six trillion annually by 2021. And then at the same time, global ransomware damage costs are expected to exceed 11.5 billion. And this says by 2019, which is actually this year. So ransomware is, is hitting all of us. I mean, uh, a good friend of mine, his personal uh, NAS storage in his house with all his baby pictures was infected with ransomware. So, you know, ransomware uh, isn't just uh, for the very large companies you hear about in the news, it's it's affecting everyone out there. And so with that, uh, let's kick it off with our first question here. So the first question, and, and I'll say this, the a lot of the questions at the start of this event are a little bit more general uh, education around ransomware. We had many questions come in about, you know, exactly how ransomware works. And so this question is, you know, what's the most common way that people can get infected with ransomware? And uh, Eric, I'll direct this question to you. Yeah, so, you know, what I see going on out there, there's actually two really hot ways that people seem to be getting infected by ransomware. Um, number one is phishing links. Uh, people click on things in an email. Um, that's the number one way to do it. The number two way that seems to be going on um, is like a uh, remote desktop protocol or RDP exposed to the internet. Um, Sam Sam seems to do a, a great job of exploiting that, but uh, certainly the number one way is phishing um, and the human side of things. And then number two is the RDP side. So it's possible to get infected with ransomware even if I never clicked on anything you're saying? Yeah, well, what'll happen is uh, a lot of times they'll brute force their way into the machine and the network that's exposed to the internet and then launch it from there. They use it as a launch platform or, or getting around through the network. Um, that is in more specific cases, uh, like Sam Sam, again, is, is one that's really famous for doing that. Um, but the most common way is to get it in through phishing. Do you think okay. it's a, a, a reasonable thing to ask people to disable RDP? Or do you think RDP is like a crucial part of people's businesses? I think in some cases it's a crucial part. However, what I do recommend people do is instead of leaving port 3389 open on the internet or even getting clever and moving it to 3390, right, um, that they set up a VPN in front of it. Good advice. Yeah, if you have to use RDP, use a VPN. Okay. Uh, and then, so I think we just kind of covered this. Um, does anyone have anything to add, though, on this topic? I mean, does ransomware spread across network shares? And to the cloud. Well, maybe we didn't cover that. Um, what's your take on that, Curtis? Yeah, I, I think I'm going to say yes, right? Uh, because once, I mean, it, it has to start with an infected system, but then they, if they start looking and they start finding other folders where they can attack, then certainly network shares that are available to them are uh, something they could attack. When we start talking about the cloud, it gets a little bit harder unless that cloud is being accessed or available as a network share, right? You know, if it's if it's a just S3 object storage, that's a little bit harder, especially if, if you've locked down S3. But if it's S3 object storage, it's available as an NFS server in your data center, um, then sure. Okay. I would only add that, you know, the, the term cloud is somewhat imprecise. So it kind of depends on what you're talking about. But, you know, one of the aspects of ransomware is that it really needs sort of it needs a compute resource to be able to encrypt your files. So um, if you just happen to get some it, 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 it's important to know where these files are accessible from. So if you have files hosted in the cloud, they may be out there and accessible, but there's not a compute resource that can touch those files and there's nothing to encrypt them. But it depends. Okay. Yeah, that's an important clarification. Okay. 
Good. I think in, Good. Another, in another instance where we've seen these folks getting creative, kind of piggybacking on what um, Curtis had mentioned was instances that are going after SaaS applications where you've got this shared responsibility model and the vendor will provide certain level of infrastructure or even up to the application layer, but the data ultimately is the intellectual property of that organization. And we've seen um, certain demos, I forget, particular vendor um, in this case where they've uh, noticed or observed uh, ransomware going after O365 data anywhere where they can capture and extract proprietary information. Yeah, and I've seen it go after things like, you know, the, the cloud again is kind of an ambiguous term, but um, I've seen it go after um, uh, Dropbox, um, you know, if somebody has a Dropbox app in there, um, Google Drive, things like that. I mean, that's cloud, but it's, you know, connected back to the machine. And we have seen strains of ransomware that specifically target things like that, um, just like they do shadow volume copies, things like that to get rid of them because they know that um, the thing that's going to keep you from paying the ransom is being able to recover your data, obviously. So they try to go after all those different areas. Uh, one of the important things to know when it comes to spreading across network shares that I, I think we need to put out there is that generally speaking, ransomware will execute in the context of the user that launched it. So if your receptionist launches it, whatever privileges or rights that receptionist has is what's going to be able to get encrypted, right? Um, another reason to keep um, admin rights away from everybody or keep shares kind of locked down to, to who can get to them. Was it is, isn't it a real common thing though to, to have to give people admin rights on their Windows machines? Yeah, it's not just the Windows machines, but if in especially smaller organizations, you have like the S drive, the shared drive, you know, and, mm -hmm. and marketing can get to accounting, can get to, can get to, et cetera, et cetera. Any of that stuff that they have write permissions on um, is easily encrypted That's then. That's a good point. So back to the principle of least privilege. Don't give anybody access anything to uh, any more than what they really need. Okay, let's move on to question three. So does ransomware just impact Windows computers or other operating systems and storage devices as well? Um, Adam, you wanna answer that one? I think Windows Windows predominantly is the is the one that we've seen most infected, and we certainly have their market share. But there have been uh, variants of ransomware uh, ransomware Key Ranger in 2016 that was targeting um, Mac OS. So I don't think that Windows is unique in being a target, though certainly probably the largest addressable market. Okay, and Eric, I think you had something you wanted to comment on on this yeah. topic. Yeah, it was wild. Um, if you've ever heard of Xbash, um, same. Uh, same thing runs differently on uh, it, it actually impacted Linux uh, and Windows machines differently. You know, in some places it was ransomware and a botnet. Um, it, it also did other things, uh, a coin miner and some other stuff. Pretty, pretty uh, ingenious code, quite frankly, but that, that targeted even Linux machines. So I don't I think anywhere that we that we see data saved as a target. But yeah, Windows, just because it's used so much more often is is the bigger target out there, what I've seen. Okay, good, let's move on from some of these more uh, introductory questions uh, and talk about ransomware as a service. <clears throat> so uh, Eric, since you were last talking, tell us what ransomware as a service is and how does it work? Yeah, okay, so you know, the bad guys, um, they're, they're more, um, complicated than uh, than a lot of people think. You know, these aren't the, the kids in the basement of their, their parents' house drinking Mountain Dew, eating pizza, right? Um, this is organized groups that are doing this. And so I think what they've done is they've kind of looked around and said, well, we got software as a service, platform as a service, all these as a services. Let's go ahead and let's, let's introduce ransomware as a service. And that's exactly what they did. They said, we're going to handle all the back end stuff. We're going to handle all the um, key management and all that kind of good stuff, uh, even the Bitcoin, um, you know, exchanging and write the code. And a lot of times what they do is it's a profit margin splitting sort of thing here, right? So like dot ransomware, I think was a 50-50 split where the bad guys paid nothing to get into it. Um, they got a 50% of the profit margin, anything that was uh, done with the developer. Um, we've seen even a version of server that was like a 70-30 split. So the people sending the emails actually doing the attacks get 70% of the profit where the malware authors actually only get 30%, but they don't have to do the hard work. Um, and again, it's like $0 to buy into this stuff most of the time. 
<laughs> scary stuff. It's like the Apple App Store or something here. And you can just, so anyone can just click and deploy ransomware. I mean, what do they need as a target? Like the IP address or the email of the person they're targeting? It's usually email addresses. I mean, and, and believe it or not, there's a couple of those available out there. If you look at like, you know, collection number one through five and, and all of that, this is not a hard thing to get. So what they do is they, they farm all this stuff out and then they just start putting together these emails and, and try to get people to click on stuff. Scary stuff, scary stuff, which just increases the uh, amount of ransomware or a, a ransomware attacks, making it so easy. So let's move on to question five here. So is it ever a good idea to pay the ransom as an option within the recovery process and do most companies pay? Um, Matt, what's your take? I, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but I think we're all gonna agree that don't pay uh, if you can avoid it. I think there's a cost benefit analysis there. I mean, if your company is gonna go out of business and your only option is to pay, that's a decision that you have to make. But I think every security professional out there is going to say, don't pay. All you're doing is emboldening these people. You're, you're funding their future efforts to exploit other users. Yeah, and, I, and I think it's, I, I, and I think that the people who make a simple, or they think they're making a simple decision, they're like, well, it's going to take us 10 days to recover. And that's going to, we're going to lose $1 million in business. And these guys only want $100,000. So we're saving $900,000. Um, no, <laughs> right. You know, you, it, it's, it's, you, you have to factor in, you know, what Matt said, you have to factor in the fact that, you know, you are emboldening every company that pays just makes it harder for everyone else. And that should hopefully matter. And then, uh, Eric, I, I think he should, the, the thing you mentioned about what this stuff funds. Yeah. So, um, we were talking about this in the pre-call. I mean, uh, the bad thing about ransomware is, again, uh, these are run by uh, organized crime. These are run by nation states sometimes. And even terrorist groups have been known to play in this. And they, they fund their activities through a lot of this stuff. So um, what I like to tell people is, you know, the FBI's firm stance on this or, or their overall stance on this is don't pay. But when I talk to the special agents on the ground, when I talk to those folks, most of them understand, yeah, if it's a matter of shutting your doors or paying a, a $10,000 ransom, what are you going to do, right? You, you kind of got to do what you got to do. And then I tell people, well, if you end up doing that, make yourself not vulnerable to that again and try to spread the word if you can, right? At least try to do some good out of it. Um, uh, but ultimately, what, what I find is... Um, a lot of times organizations are surprised by the time it takes to do the restores on this. And they may know that, oh, it only takes me two hours to restore a PC so we can take care of it. But then what about when all 250 PCs go down and now you're trying to restore all of those? They greatly underestimate that. And so they end up in a position where sometimes they have to do that. And this is, is a there, question if, that just came in. I'm sorry, David. If, oh, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Is there is there any are there any stats? Does anybody know on the degree to which paying a ransomware makes you a further target for ransomware? I mean, it seems obvious to me, but basically what you've established is that you will pay. You know, is it you know, is it like blackmail where all you're proving is that, you know, they can come back to you again? Are there any stats on that? Anybody? I haven't I've seen, seen stats any. about how many people pay and never get a, re a recovery key, right? They just, they pay the money and then the people just walk away. But I haven't seen stats on, on that. You know, I, I've heard correlation to that um, where it's like, okay, so once you've done that, then they share that information and you may be a target for that. And even other things, because at that point, they know that you're a somewhat vulnerable organization. Uh, as far as actual published stats, I've never seen anything. And that brings us, like you just said there, Matt, um, a question from Timothy in the audience. He said, are there cases where people or companies pay the ransom, but they never get the <clears> encryption? <throat> Have you seen that, Eric? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We see that. Now, what happens is most of the, and I hate to use this phrase, legitimate uh, ransomware operators, um, <laughs> they, they actually want to get people to um, you know, to pay and they want to get the data back, right? There's even places where you can leave feedback that, yes, I got my data back because that helps them be able to get people to pay, right? 
Um, and so they've actually done that where they, they've offered tech support. I mean, look at Spora, if you've ever seen that version of ransomware, outstanding online tech support. OK, I mean, it's better than some of the other apps we, we get around here. It's kind of sad. Um, but but they did that because it's a customer service thing. when they're going to separate people from their money. If people are already suspicious about what's going on, you know, that's a problem. Now, there are some bad actors that have gone out there and they have basically they have no way to decrypt this, but they're riding on the quote unquote um, good, uh, you know, reputation of other ransomware people that have said, yeah, we paid and got it back. So you take a this risk. This all just seems wrong. <laughs> it is. It's very it wrong. Is wrong. <laughs> five, five stars for this ransomware company. <laughs> right. You need like Yelp for ransomware. 1,100 yeah. reviews. Wouldn't right. you feel dirty just typing up that review, you know? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's move on. Uh, and let's talk about prevention here. So what's the best way to prevent ransomware? Uh, Adam, why don't you start? Yeah, absolutely. And it goes back to, I think, what, what Eric had been saying at the beginning, the first and foremost, because social engineering has become so prevalent in proliferating these attacks, uh, being able to educate and protect your users first and foremost, you know, double checking those sender addresses where a capital L is now a lowercase L. They're very, very sophisticated, as Eric had mentioned, in how they're able to design these, making them look uh, legitimate, but make sure as well you're regularly updating patches, doing the associated reboot. Don't just apply the patch and not reboot that machine or that server, um, keeping your antivirus, anti-malware up to date and continuing to monitor the network for anomalous activity, unspecified or unauthorized updates, devices being added in, all things you can do on the forefront to keep an eye on what's going on on your network. Excellent. Yeah. And so, Eric, I mean, know before is the ransomware prevention company. Why don't you talk for a second about what you all do? Yeah, so I, I mean, we take the human factor and, and we, we function as we try to make a human firewall, really. Um, and what that means is being able to spot these attacks through the phishing. And again, it's, it is the number one way of doing it. Um, you know, but the other thing that happens with this too is um, like Sam Sam, uh, Hancock Health, as a matter of fact, got hit with ransomware through Sam Sam. Sam Sam had actually gotten in and gotten credentials from a vendor and then used that to do the attack through the RDP to spread it. So those vendors gave up their credentials too. So that's where the training comes in also is teaching people to be careful where they're putting their credentials, careful what they're clicking on and, and just having a better security posture. And that's where the training really, really shines is, is getting that sort of a mentality in place. Um, and that's a key thing. Excellent. And, and then moving on to the second part of this question here, what's the best way to detect and pro, uh, protect data from ransomware. Matt, what do, what do you all do at Rubrik? The approach that we advise is to you know, have solid backups. Um, that's really your insurance policy, right? Uh, and we try to make that as simple as possible. Um, so we have a very easy to use backup platform. And the way that we provide that protection piece is essentially analyzing snapshot data as it, as it comes in. We build a, a baseline based off all your file ads, deletions, changes, et cetera. And once we've built that baseline, we can look for anomalous behavior. And when we see it, we'll immediately alert the user on it. Um, so this is our approach. And sort of, you know, we're, we advise everybody to be backing up all their critical systems and so that we can just layer on our radar uh, platform, which is what we use for our ransomware detection. So since that, you know, that we already have that metadata, metadata it's, it's not too difficult for us to then look for signs of a ransomware attack or any sort of anomalous behavior. Okay, and Curtis, what about at Druva? How do you how do you help people to detect and prevent or protect themselves from ransomware? Yeah, on one hand, uh, you know, similar to what Matt said, you know, we also have a you know machine learning thing to to look for and detect ransomware and to notify you when uh, when we see that. Uh, and then also on you know on top of um, you know the, the the idea of good backup, we obviously we would completely agree. Um, we like to uh, talk about the fact that we that our backup, all of our backups are stored uh, in Amazon in S3, and so it's like we see it as just an additional layer of protection, sort of it, similar to an air gap. It's not technically an air gap, but but it's just moving the data one step farther away from the attackers. And then uh, the other thing, and and I know Matt, uh, I know Rubric does this as well, but this idea of of DR as a service, right? So when when it, when I hear 
um, when I hear about data centers, like it's one thing to have laptops and file shares or whatever to be attacked, but when I hear of data centers being shut down and businesses unable to function because their their servers were attacked, um, it just kills me because there are plenty of solutions, and ours is one of them, that allow you to easily bring up your entire data center in a VPC so that you can continue to function with the last known good backup right, um, while you then go and fully remediate from it in your data center, right? Um, and, 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 uh, the, and of course, even though we offer ransomware detection, we would also fully recommend that you use, you know, intrusion detection and prevention software on the front end. We are simply the, you know, the last line of defense. Excellent. I like that. So you can bring up your last good backup in an alternate data center or in the cloud and get your critical business applications fun functioning rapidly, right? Right. So these stories you hear about uh, companies in the news that were down for a week or two weeks or whatever it was, because they had to restore their data and it took much longer than they thought. Obviously they didn't have something like that. Is that? Yeah, right? they either didn't have it or, or what they, you know, I mean, the idea of DRAS is not, that new, but um, I, I think it's just becoming more and more popular and more and more feasible for people. Uh, but I think what most of these people are doing is they're just doing typical restores, right? They're just, um, you know, and, and honestly, you know, I've been a backup for a quarter of a century. And one thing that's remained constant is that nobody wants to be the backup guy. And so, uh, you know, I get, you give it to the junior person. And uh, as soon as, you know, he or she gets a clue, they leave backup and you end up with this n not having any um, uh, expertise in the backup and the DR area. Uh, and so, and then as a result, it just, the system never gets tested. Uh, and then it gets tested. Unfortunately, the first time it gets fired, it gets fired in anger. And nobody has any idea, you know, how the thing works. And, oh, oh, look at this. It, it takes time to restore 100 terabytes of data. Imagine <laughs> that. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be a surprise, but it is. Right, right. Okay, good. This is good info. Let's move on. Um, and this next question is, why is it so hard for an antivirus program to detect ransomware? Uh, Eric? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I don't have a whole lot of complimentary things to say about antivirus, to be honest with you guys. <laughs> Um, especially the antivirus that's signature based these days, uh, it, it just it, it gets more too fast, right? Antivirus is trivial for hackers to get around these days. Um, I do see value in ones that do like some of the anomaly detection um, or the heuristics that are there that look more like patterns as opposed to signatures, if that makes sense. Um, but frankly, I mean, antivirus is is one of these things that pretty much uh, all the hackers, all, all the attackers know it. it's just trivial to bypass these days. And a lot of it is just things morph so fast. There's different versions and different things that just come out so fast. I do like the behavior analysis though. You know, you got, you got Bob and marketing all of a sudden is encrypting 200 files per minute. Wow, that's kind of strange behavior. Bob's never encrypted anything. We should consider that's a problem, right? Um, so I, I like that, but most of the time, um, there's just ways around that. Okay, so antivirus isn't gonna save the day and protect us from ransomware, right? It is, it's one of those Hail Mary, throw in a hundred yard sort of passes and just hoping for the best, quite frankly. And like I said, there's some decent things out there that, that do some other parts of it, but your general antivirus is just not gonna help you, frankly. Okay. And here's a question that just came in. Um, essentially, I'll summarize it. Uh, Brian is asking, what about protection for small businesses? Um, Adam, do you have any advice on you know, how small businesses might best protect themselves from ransomware? I think that I would I would go back to from the from the backup and the recovery side of things and Curtis had mentioned an air gap. I think that that's the most important where in a lot of cases the mysticism around you know cloud and you know, where's my data going is it secure what kind of privacy those in a lot of cases i think the fog has been lifted there but a lot of concerns are still around cost and there are certainly vendors out there with 
you know, purpose-built cloud models, Unitrends, for example, where we're licensing per data set and for retention rather than you know ingress, egress, data transfer, utilization, things like that. But where cost is still prohibitive, I still think that getting a cold copy off-site and creating that air gap with those clean backups um, is going to be the best ways in which you can safeguard your business so that you've got a copy that's not on the production network. Yeah, great point. Get that data off-site some way, shape, or form. Okay, so let's see here. Moving on to question A. Um, are there different variants of ransomware that I need to protect myself from? And, and then kind of the follow-up to that is, is the answer going to be the same no matter what? Um, Matt? I think you should be wary of all of them. I don't think there's a particular one <clears throat> you need to be focusing on. And it relates back to the, the question we just talked about. They're going to change very quickly. Um, so as soon as maybe you've built some specific protection, something else is going to come along that you're going to miss. So, you know, that really looking for the behavior is what you want to try to detect. And uh, as Eric mentioned, there's some good tools that do that. Um, but you really want a defense in depth approach. And that's really the only way that's going to uh, give you, that's how you're going to get the most protection from these things. So I don't, maybe somebody has a different opinion. I don't see why you target a specific variant or, or ransomware strain. You want to try to avoid all of them. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Uh, Curtis, any different take on that? Uh, no, I did, nothing uh, different, different, but I, it did make me think about, one of the things that we do push people to do, and that is, I, I think it's become more important today to keep a longer string of history in your backups than before, right? It, it used to be, it used to be okay to say, look, we, we never restore anything older than a week old. And so we're just going to do, you know, a week's worth of retention in our backups. That has become a really, really bad idea now because what, what you're, finding is you are finding some variants that are sort of creepily encrypting, right? Encrypting data slowly, and then and then finally they get noticed, and they're like, okay, now you're shut down, right? Uh, that, you know, the advanced persistent threat idea, right? And then so keep it, keep it, I think it's become more important to keep backup sets for a longer period of time because once you detect it, then finding, you know, then it's a matter of finding the known good backup and then restoring to that. And if you don't keep enough history to do that, um, then that's a big deal. And, and, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, one of the things, one of the questions earlier about cloud, um, ransomware can get, you know, to some SaaS providers. And there are those who think that the, the SaaS provider, you know, it's, a, it's in the cloud, so I don't need to back it up. Right. Um, you know, and the reason why I brought that up now is that their their retention periods are often very short for any of the it you know built in data protection tools that they have, uh, and it'd be really easy to to blow through things. Okay, let's see another question that came in here, and I think this is an easy, quick answer, but I'll let you answer it, uh, Eric. Should we assume that every organization will at some point be infected with ransomware? Oh, man, uh, that's actually a tough one, because I wouldn't say we would assume that everyone is going to be infected. But I think we need to protect ourselves as if that is a real threat, because it is a real threat. Um, are you going to be targeted? Are you going to happen to, to, you know, win the lottery on that one? Who knows? Uh, you may go through life without it. But uh, honestly, a lot of the same things that are going to protect you from ransomware are going to protect you from any other kind of malware, any other kind of attacks, right? If you think about it, like, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, network segmentation. So if you do get hit with ransomware, you try to keep it, you know, uh, down to a few machines instead of everything you have. Well, that same principle helps if you get an attacker that actually gets into your system and they're cruising around. Then they have walls they have to get through, right? So um, I, I'm not a big one of of saying assume the breach because we can just assume we're going to get hit, but we absolutely have to be prepared for it. Uh, just in case we do, because otherwise that's that's where we find these people that that significantly struggle. Yeah, if you just change the word would to could, then I would totally agree with the statement. Assume that every environment could get attacked, 
because the, the, the hardest thing, like outside of ransomware, the hardest thing that I struggle with is, well, we've never had a fire. <laughs> we've never had a flood. Our disk drives have never failed. I don't know why I need backups. Okay. Yeah. All right. Good for you. Agreed. Right. Yeah, I mean, I equate it to kind of like driving a car. I mean, you should assume at some point you might get in an accident. So, you know, you should do two things. You should, one, you know, defi drive defensively and try to prevent the accident, which is what we're talking about here with user education. And then you should, too, you know, have insurance in case you do get into an accident. And that's kind of like the, the data protection. You should have a good data protection solution if you do get in, in an accident to cover you. And that accident, like you said, Curtis, could take many different forms, um, whether it's ransomware or you know any other sort of disaster. But you still need that that sort of protection, uh, whether you're driving a car or protecting your company's data. Yep. All right. So let's see. Let's move on here. Question number nine: What are the best practices to mitigate ransomware once you are infected? So you got infected. Now what do you do? Kind of thing. Um, Eric, you want to take that? <laughs> Jeez. Um, I found that uh, your your favorite type of beer is a good way to start, right? Because <laughs> things have gone bad for you probably, right? You might as well just kind of go into this with a, uh, with a better uh, attitude, I suppose. Uh, you know, basically, some of the key things that you need to do, um, especially if you're finding yourself in the midst of infection, like you're, you're sitting there watching the files on your share be renamed with some other extension, you start unplugging things, um, you know, try to find your patient zero, get it off the wire, because as was mentioned earlier, you need compute power to do this most of the time. Um, and in many cases, if you can find your patient zero, you can stop um, the ongoing infection piece. Um, but ultimately, what you want to do is you want to try to research a little bit about the type of ransomware too. Um, because in some cases, people have gotten super lucky and found out that somebody has released a key or figured out how to reverse engineer a type of ransomware and they have a master key or something that they can get their data back with. That's always a fantastic thing. Um, but you know, frankly, once you've been infected, you're gonna be restoring um, your data. That, that's really what it boils down to. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody want to add to that? Um, Eric mentioned network segmentation earlier. So um, I think that's a super important thing to underscore that if you can quickly isolate an infected host, it's going to it's going to really reduce the impact or the blast radius of that ransomware. You know, as, as Eric mentioned as well, kind of determining what that patient zero was, Matt had mentioned that Rubrik has predictive analytics, Unitrends has an engine as well that can detect for anomalous changes. And what you'll see is that your backup log will leave you kind of little hints as to when this started. Your incrementals will start growing in size. Every file here is essentially being changed and those encrypted files can't be deduped and compressed. So leverage your backups as well when you're looking to diagnose or detect for that patient zero to find that first infected machine. Well, oh, that's an interesting tip. I didn't I didn't think that the backup log would be able to help you. So that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you, Adam. All right. Let's see here. Question 10. How quickly can I recover from ransomware after an attack? And do I need to test that? Um, Matt, you want to start with that? Sure. It's, <clears throat> it's going to be a function of, you know, how simple and, and performant your backup solution is. You know, at Rubrik, we hang our hat on the simplicity of our product. Um, and particularly when it comes to recovering from ransomware, um, our, our radar application, uh, which runs uh, as a SaaS product that's analyzing these backup logs um, to look for ransomware infection, it'll show you very easily exactly everything that was, you know, removed, encrypted, et cetera, and just with a few clicks, uh, you can begin the process to restore those files. It's still going to be a function of how much data is backed up, right? I mean, we can't break the laws of physics and especially if you've got, you know, perhaps data archived out into the cloud that you need to pull back into your own data center. That's a function of your network um, bandwidth, uh, but you absolutely need to test it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying you should go out and simulate a ransomware event, but you need to be testing restores of your backups, whether that's into your data center, into, you know, maybe a DR, VPC in the cloud that was mentioned previously. That's a key piece of, of any uh, backup solution. And Curtis, do you want to add on to that? 
Yeah, so we've already talked about the VPC thing and DR, and I think that's really important to talk about. But uh, right now, I'll just mention that uh, Druva uh, has two very different products, one that's aimed at the data center and then one that's aimed at uh, laptops. And one of the things about the way we're designed and running in the cloud is that our system automatically scales up and scales down throughout, throughout the day based on the compute needs of our customers. And so if there was a large ransomware infection of one of our customers, I mean, we have, we have customers that back up, you know, over 100,000 laptops, right? Like individual customers that have, I can think of one customer has like 15 petabytes of laptop data stored in our cloud. Um, if that customer issued a very large restore request, if they had a massive uh, ransomware attack, uh, that they were unable to stop, then uh, the one interesting thing about the way we would do things is that, again, our system would automatically scale up. And the only thing that would limit that restore uh, would be the bandwidth to those individual people, right? So if they were all in one data center or if they were, you know, mobile users or whatever, uh, we would be able to scale up to, to meet whatever. But again, it's the same, back to the same, you know, it's the answer. <laughs> It's a classic consultant answer. It depends. It depends on how much data you're going to have to restore, uh, and it depends on the bandwidth that you're going to have to do. And the answer to the second question is absolutely. Do I need to test that? Right. That's the number one problem is that people just don't test their backups. Right. Test. You know, you don't have to simulate a ransomware attack, but most laptops have plenty of, of extra storage space. Practice restoring everything that you backed up from that laptop to somewhere else on that laptop or PC or whatever, you know, whatever we're talking about here, do that. And don't just do one, do like a hundred, do a thousand um, and, uh, uh, and see what that looks like. And then see if that you can identify, um, you know, uh, what, do you, what do you call it? Um, uh, bottlenecks. That, that was the word. Yeah. <laughs> that was the word I, bottlenecks was the word I was looking for. Uh, identify bottlenecks in your network infrastructure or your backup infrastructure uh, to and, and fix those before you have to fire it in anger. Yeah, and good I would advice. add also find a way to automate that testing. You know, absolutely, don't manual, absolutely. Don't use the painful script it. That's going to make your your testing process a lot easier to consume. APIs are a good thing. Mm -hmm. So when I, I'm curious, Adam, I'll follow up uh, follow up question for that. I mean, when you say automate the testing, um, what sorts of things, you know, would you test? I mean, obviously just a backup and a recovery, but can you go into a little bit more detail? So where we where we do things a little bit different at Unitrends is we do a built-in um, testing and it's down to the application level. So gone are the days of kind of the Schrodinger's backup, if you will. We don't know if it's good if we haven't tested it. And in a lot of cases, vendors will bring you, they'll give you that green check mark. Yes, the backup was completed. We brought you to the login screen. We didn't actually log into the machine. We can't certify the underlying applications. We don't know if our instances are intact. And that's where Unitrends can go a little bit step, uh, a little bit of a step further. This is built in locally as well with our cloud disaster recovery as a service. So you've got full confidence not only in what your recovery point, recovery time actuals are for those particular machines, but also certifying those underlying applications and understanding that they will behave as expected should we need to call upon them for a restore. Okay. Yeah, I think that's important. You script and automate your testing and then, you know, test as, as thoroughly as you can. So let's see, question 11 here. What is it about the design of your data protection system that makes ransomware recovery fast and or easy? And I think we, we covered a little bit of that. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we move on? Because we've got uh, not a lot of time and quite a few more questions left here. So what can I do to automate my ransomware protection as much as possible? And actually, this goes to a question that came in from Adam out in the audience. Uh, he said, uh, we know it's possible to detect and flag ransomware, but is it possible to automate actions upon those decisions, such as immediately cutting off the infected resource? Is that something that's possible, um, Matt? I'd say it's possible. It probably something you want to be a little bit careful with. That might actually be a scenario where you might want to, to simulate a ransomware attack to make sure that, that this process uh, works as expected. But um, you know, we're a totally API-driven uh, product, um, so we make it very easy to integrate in with whatever automation tool you might be using in your data center. So um, you, 
we are automatically searching for signs of, of ransomware in your backups. So, I mean, that's not with, with rubric, that's not something that you have to automate on your own. We take care of that for you, but sort of automating remediation or saying we want to use an alert to then isolate a host. Um, you can then, you could get the information you need from our APIs and then plug that into the rest of your, your automation framework. Okay. Eric, have you seen any solutions out there, systems that, when a ransomware attack starts, something's triggered yeah. and cuts it off, cuts off the so, dragon's head. So the term solution um, is one that I, I think we we mentioned in the pre-talk. Um, there is no solution, frankly, uh, but I, I have seen some interesting things with the user behavior analytics piece, the UBA stuff, where if something starts going wrong, um, they can terminate a network session uh, or do something like that, kill some processes immediately, if not sooner, based on some of that. Um, it's still something that's growing. Um, I think it has some decent promise with that. Um, I like places like that where you can do that, where you can say, hey, hold on a second. Are you really sure this is what you want to do? And, and, you know, I've seen things even, um, we have some tools here that uh, basically, uh, it, when somebody goes and clicks on a link, it, it pops up and says, are you really sure you want to go to this link? And it also kind of lays out where the link is really going. I mean, that's it's a different type of protection with automation like that, but it's giving them choices. So anywhere that you can do those sorts of things to kind of sometimes slow down what's happening, whether it be a kicking off or somebody making a bad decision, I think um, uh, there's some tools out there for that. But I think it is definitely something that's a, a fledgling market right now. But certainly will be growing. And as we improve the user behavior analytics, I think it's going to become a, a bigger piece of things. I know one of the things we do is we, you know, if we detect ransomware, one of the things we will do is stop the backups on that particular, you know, if there's one infected system, uh, there, there's no point in further backing up that system. Uh, and just, you know, it's not really going to infect the backups per se, but it's just going to waste a lot of bandwidth and storage and, you know, all of that, right? Because uh, you could still restore prior to that, but there's no point in backing up the infected data. Okay. Okay, good. Good. I'm learning a lot on this. I hope the audience is too, or I'm, I'm confident that they are too, because I know I am. So uh, let's see, next question here. How do we avoid getting my backups encrypted as well? Um, Adam, is that possible? If ransomware, say, takes over a network share, um, can it go and encrypt the backups? So it, it certainly could, and we've seen instances where Windows-based repositories have had their backups encrypted. Uh, encrypted. I think it goes back to um, what I think all three of us, the backup vendors, were in concert on, which is that air gap or getting that safe copy um, taken securely off-site. In, in Unitrend's instance, we are built on a Linux repository, a hardened Linux kernel. Um, again, it doesn't make us immune, but we don't have some of the same vulnerabilities or loopholes that you do with Windows-based systems. But ultimately, I think it does come down to getting a secure copy, kind of that age-old adage of the three-two-one rule, and making sure that one of those, in some way, is is coming off site. Okay. Yeah, the big worry I have uh, is, you know, and this is not picking on data domain, but there are a huge number of people with data domain devices that, you know, using them as a target for backups, and it's not that data domain is bad; it's that it is an NFS or an SMB mount that could be accessed by an infected system. And you need to um, do everything you can to, to protect that, right? To see if there's a way other than NFS or SMB, like in the case of data domain, they have other ways to write to their uh, data store in other than NFS and SMB. Because if there is a system that is a Windows system that is accessing that, like again, Adam mentioned Windows-based backup servers, that are writing to that share, if that Windows-based backup server gets infected, it can indeed encrypt those backups. Uh, and, you know, so just limit, like, if there's a way, you know, ask your backup vendor if there's a way to have it so that you can write to your network share backup system, right? It might not be a data domain system in some way other than NFS or SMB, in some way that doesn't have it just show up as a folder in your backup system uh, because there are absolutely documented cases of, of you know backup products or customers having their backup data be encrypted because it's accessible as a folder on their backup system. We, we would recommend 
or we would use the term immutability, and that's sort of how we built our product from the ground up. Is, and there's other vendors who do this as well. But you know, once a backup is taken, it can't be changed. I mean, obviously, if you can get to it, if it's on an SMB share, then you might be in trouble. Uh, but uh, similar to the other solutions that were mentioned, like once we ingest a backup, it can't be changed. So that's really what we think is one of the, the major uh, features that you want to be looking for uh, to defend against ransomware. Yeah, and that's where I've seen this go wrong is when basically a network share is available and they're backing up to that. And then somebody, again, it comes back to permissions too, right? If you don't have permissions to write to that that file or folder in there, then you're not going to be able to encrypt it. But um, if all of those have the same, let's say, service account or something like that running on them where they can touch the other stuff, they can easily encrypt it, right? Um, I'm always surprised to see, uh, I get questions about this quite a bit. Um, even people going, well, what if I encrypt it first? Then it won't be encrypted, right? And and uh, and people are, are honestly confused about that. I mean, we, we kind of laugh about it because we know better, but um, that's very true. You know, the fact that it's already encrypted is not going to stop it from being encrypted again, right. uh, more than likely, unless it's something that's just after, frankly, if it's just after certain file type extensions like JPEG or DOCs or something like that, that actually could be something that could save you, but boy, I wouldn't hold on to that one. <laughs> you, you make a really good point, Eric, about the account. Um, and so if you do have a Windows backup server uh, or a Linux backup server, right, either way, um, you should not be doing anything on that box other than using the backup interface. You should not be reading your email. You should not be clicking on any links because you're probably running it as a privileged account because you're running the backup software. And that privileged account, again, could have access to your to your backups. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, which, again, which is another reason why we, you know, we, we like to store the backups in some other location other than uh, a share. That's really good advice. That's actually something I didn't think about. So make sure you're not doing anything else on your backup server except backups. Don't be surfing the web on the Windows backup server. That's not probably not good. Um, OK, let's see, uh, moving on, question 14. What's the best way to test to see if you're vulnerable to ransomware? Uh, Eric, why don't you start with that? Uh, mostly, I just say start clicking all the links that come in. Um, they'll let you know real soon. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there are some tools out there that will look at things. We actually have one called Ransom, um, which is pretty cool. And, and what it'll actually do is it, it kind of tests your endpoint protection and tests some of that sorts of things. Um, it launches and uh, basically what it does is it mimics a bunch of different types of ransomware to see if your endpoint protection picks up on that. Um, I love that as a tool, but um, it, most of the time, quite frankly, uh, you're you're pretty much going to be vulnerable to ransomware. Let's let's just say that uh, you just assume that you're vulnerable for it and save yourself some time um, of doing some in-depth testing. I do like the ransom tool though for that for tuning endpoint protection and making sure that it spots that behavior. I think there's a lot of um, use in that, but I wouldn't spend a lot of time um, trying to run tests and stuff. But not it. You, you would like not white hat testing. You know. White hat people calling up and you know trying to to see if your people would click social engineering testing. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's not really testing to see if you're vulnerable to ransomware. It's testing to see if you're vulnerable. Period. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I know the the bank I used to work at. Uh, what we would do is you know we trained repeatedly. You know we kept telling everybody no one in IT will ever call you and ask you for your password, right? We'd say that over and over and over again. And then we had an entire team of people whose job it was to call people and ask them for their password just to see just to see what they would do. And I think it worked like 20% of the time. It was just sad. Yeah, we could do a whole nother um, uh, panel here on uh, you know social engineering attacks and, and things like that. Um, that. That's a whole nother issue, uh, but uh, you know, testing for vulnerability to ransomware specifically, I think most places simply are. Okay, yeah, that's I, good the, advice. The, the, the people aspect is, is like you, well, likely your vector for infection, but you know, defense in depth, run a vulnerability scanner, get a report every week about what needs to be patched that never hurts. Good, good. Okay, let's see. Question 15, is there any way to calculate the financial cost of a ransomware attack? 
Matt, have you seen anything like that or ever had someone come up with numbers like that? Well, it's pretty easy. How much is your data worth to your business, right? And how much would it cost to lose it all potentially? Um, you know, data is, you know, digital gold. That's what we're calling it now, right? Um, so it's going to be a function of, of what that data means to your business. And uh, there may be a, a better way to calculate it than just sort of that simple answer. But um, I think that should give most people pause to, to think about what it, what it would be like for their business if their their main database of all their customers and transactions just went away. You know, that's that's tough. Yeah, I think I've seen a number out there that was uh, put out. I think um, it was one hundred and thirty three thousand dollars was the typical cost of an of a ransomware attack. And it took uh, on average, I think it was about a week to get all of the data re returned. I've seen some numbers on that. So anyone out there with a business should, you know, seriously consider those numbers. Um, you know, what would it cost if they lost all their data and what would the impact be and how long would it take to get it back? So that's great advice. Um, let's see, we're coming up to the top of the hour here, starting to run out of time. There's just a few more questions. Uh, Morgan is asking, if keeping the data on a local system makes it any safer instead of an outside storage device? Uh, I don't believe so, but Curtis? Uh, say that a question again? It, does keeping data locally on the local system make it any safer than an outside or network storage device? No, I, I would say the opposite. But if we're talking about protected like data to be the protected, um, I, I would say, I would say no, there's kind of no difference I, I mean, typically, but in terms of the protected data, I do, obviously, you know, I work at Druva, we're a cloud company, but, uh, and we're going to want to store that data in the cloud to keep it, to keep the, you know, it's the whole three, two, one rule to keep one copy somewhere else other than where the data is being protected. Yeah, good point. And we've talked about that, the air gap, get, getting data offsite, how important that is. Yeah. Um, so let's see, it's three minutes left in our event today. Um, final question. Uh, if we just go down the list here of, of each of my panelists, do you want to just tell me, uh, starting with Matt, you know, if, if someone's interested in rubric out there uh, for data protection, what should their first step be? So uh, for Rubric, you can go to rubric.com. We've got a lot of resources just right there on the front page. There's a button there to click for contact sales if you want to get in, in touch with your local team to get you get a real demo and or even a proof of concept. But our blog is a great resource as well. We've got some good stuff on there. Okay, awesome. And Adam? Yeah, I would I would agree. www.unitrans.com is a place a uh, great place to get started. We provided a copy of our uh, ransomware and getting started for begin ransomware for beginners. Our ebook there um, with contact information for sales. If you go to unitrans.com backslash events, we've got a number of virtual and in market events, public demonstrations of the product, um, and are always happy to have folks call in or chat in on the website if they're looking to learn a little bit more about uh, Unitrans solutions. Excellent. And Eric. Yeah, um, nobefore.com. We actually have some links there for, uh, we can do a free uh, phishing test for you if you want to figure out just how vulnerable your people are. Uh, most people that do that come back and um, uh, they're, uh, uh, they're a little surprised. Uh, <laughs> overall, we, we did a test. It was 6 million users, 11,000 uh, organizations. And on average, uh, we got about 27% click rates across that. So your organization is probably sitting right around there too. It can be pretty eye-opening. So that's what you want to do is figure that out. Um, and then you have some ammo too to go to the boss and be like, okay, we got a problem. I can quantify that now. So that'll help you and that's free. Excellent. All right. And Curtis? Uh, so, you know, similar answers to other people, you know, druva.com, obviously. Uh, we actually, if you're interested in endpoint protection, uh, we can actually run a, uh, a full uh, like an actual demo that you can act, not just a, something you can look at, but within a within a few minutes you can be protecting uh, some some laptops and mobile devices because you know because because we run in the cloud, all it is is a matter of installing a uh, an agent on a laptop or a mobile device to be protected. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been a great event. I've learned a lot from you guys. I, I really appreciate all your insight, and I appreciate the audience joining us today. 
Thank you so much, Matt, Adam, Eric, Curtis. Good to have you on. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. It was a pleasure to be here. All right. Thank you, everyone in the audience. Uh, make sure you check out the handouts available for download there in your audience console. And I hope to see you on the next panel cast.